everybody. This is Robert Chadwick with America Mortgages. Thank you for joining us for our most recent monthly webinar. We are super excited uh, to have uh, Joel Barreto from Abacus Wealth International join us. Um, we uh, will discuss the uh, options for uh, wealth planning along with wealth planning with real estate. And then as we always do, we'll cover uh, some uh, mortgage options. So Joel, uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, perhaps maybe you can tell us a little bit about yourself and your company and uh, start us off. Thanks, Robert. Um, thank you for joining me to, uh, us here today and thank you for having me here, Robert. Um, I, I, do, I, do I start here? Is this where I get started? Yeah, sure. So why don't you tell us about yourself um, and then, you know, about Abacus and what you're going to be covering in the webinar, and then you can share your slides and uh, then we'll go from there. All right. Well, a, a lot of the introduction is going to be covered in my uh, in my slides. So if you don't mind, I'm just going to go ahead um, and uh, uh, take that part of the slide. And then if you want to uh, jump in, uh, just let me know. Let me share my slide here real quick. All right. Thank you, thank you. Um, all right, before I begin, I'd like to go through a, a quick uh, disclaimer just to uh, appease our um, compliance department and I'll go into some introductions. And if Robert, uh, you have anything to add, uh, just let me know, just um, um, interrupt me at any time, okay? All right, great. Um, Abacus Wealth International, we are a fee-based California SEC registered investment advisor fiduciary specializing in cross-border wealth management um, and financial planning services. And our objective is to develop a relationship of trust with a commitment to provide the highest standard of competent and professional financial guidance based on experience, ethical values, and excellence. A little bit about myself, um, I, uh, as, as Robert mentioned, I'm, my name is Joel Barreto. I've been a financial planner, financial advisor since 1991. I'm also a certified financial planner, and today I am the principal cross-border wealth manager here at Abacus Wealth International. So that's as much as I have for, as an introduction for myself, Robert. Uh, did you have anything to add? No, I think this is uh, good. So perhaps you go with the slides and then we will uh, switch over after you're done to the mortgage option and then we'll do a questions and answer for everybody. Great, thank you. All right, well, you know, since um, you know, I was mentioning I'm a, a wealth manager, you know, let's uh, begin with well, the de definition of what is true wealth. You see, when I ask people, you know, what your most valuable asset is, most of the time uh, people say, you know, it's their house, their stocks, their bonds, their jewelry, cars, investment. These are what we call your financial or your material wealth. But sometimes, you know, I'm, I'm talking to the wife and uh, she would say something different. Then she would say, it's, it's actually my family, my health, my values, my spirituality, heritage, character, relationships. These are what we call your core or your human assets and your human wealth. Um, and then the, you have these um, assets that define your wisdom and your intellect. Um, and this is your knowledge, your experience, your education, reputation system, methods, et cetera. Um, and then of course, we also uh, believe that your uh, community is part of your assets. So you have your civic and social responsibilities towards your community, like your taxes and your charities and your volunteerism and your contribution and so forth. So when we're talking about true wealth or we're talking about wealth management, we're talking about all this, you know, because they, they are uh, somehow interrelated and, and codependent on each other. So what is wealth management? A discipline which incorporates structuring and planning wealth to assist in growing, optimizing, protecting and transferring wealth for generations to come. Um, we are also a fiduciary where we're legally bound to act in our client's best interest. And as fiduciaries, part of our responsibility is uh, the general well being, being of our clients, efficiently managing wealth, uh, safeguarding our clients' interests, acting as their gatekeepers, 
also uh, mitigating risk and optimizing wealth. So here we believe that it is more important that your values are understood before your assets are valued. Now in wealth management, we look at four uh, branches in wealth management, that's tax saving strategies, um, investment optimization, retirement planning, and estate preservation. Now, as if wealth management was not um, uh, 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 complicated enough, uh, cross-border, this takes, uh, you know, cross-border wealth management takes uh, the traditional financial planning practice to a different level as we analyze rules and regulations from other jurisdictions in the world and how it correlates or, or coincides with people's financial objectives in tax savings, investment, retirement, and estate planning. Unfortunately, there are only a handful of wealth managers who are crazy enough to, uh, um, to take on this challenge uh, of being a cross-border financial professional, and I happen to be one of them. Um, so today, what I want to do is uh, share with you some concepts that we normally uh, share in uh, some of our workshops. Um, but before doing that, there's no doubt there's going to be some questions. And although there is nothing simple about cross-border wealth management, we will try to keep the presentation as simple as possible for the benefit of the general population in attendance today from the different parts of the world. But for the more sophisticated questions that may be country-specific or too personal and complex, we invite you to schedule a free 15-minute complimentary consultation. Uh, it's, it's free, there's no obligation, and we do it by Zoom. And you may do this through our webpage at www.abacus-wealth.com, or uh, we should have this um, link also in your chat box here today if you wanted to schedule one of these 15-minute consultations, okay? But I do believe we have some, some question and answer portion uh, later, so please feel free to ask your questions uh, later as well, all right? So, you know, part of our advocacy for financial literacy is providing for educational workshops on holistic global investment strategies. Now, one of the things we teach is successful equity management for the uh, for true asset optimization. Now, this is normally a two-hour workshop, but I will try to summarize this for you within the next eight minutes uh, with a quick uh, case study. So, without further ado, let's let's get started with this. Um, so, let's say you won a million dollars in cash in the lottery today. What would you do with that million dollar cash? Now, a lot of people would say, ah, let's invest it in real estate. So why do people like to invest in real estate? Well, mainly because it's a tangible asset. Um, it, it has equity growth potential. Uh, it has income potential. And of course, the pride of ownership. So uh, now the question would be then, how do we invest that $1 million into real estate with optimal results. So here we do some assumptions and these are just um, examples, uh, mind you. Uh, so uh, please don't take this to heart. Um, so let's talk about uh, some assumptions on real estate, okay? Let's say we can buy a million dollars uh, in real estate where the current value is a million dollars. And let's just say the average growth potential of this real estate is 7% over the next 20 years with a monthly income potential of 2,500. Now doing the math on this for 20 years where your current real estate value is 1 million growing at 7% per year um, over the next 20 years, your ending value for uh, your, your real estate will be $4,038,000. Now, if you've been collecting $2,500 per month in rent, then in the, at the end of 20 years, you would have collected like $600,000. Therefore, your total investment growth would have gone to $468,000, uh, uh, $4,638,739. So if we look at that in a, an annualized return kind of a situation, that means that your annualized return is, is about 7.97%. Now, um, you know, in, in the workshop, we normally ask three things about an investment before we actually consider the investment. Um, first question we ask, is the risk manageable? Um, based on the historical 
uh, performance of real estate, I would say it's manageable. Um, is, the re is the return acceptable based on the historical returns on real estate in, in general? Um, it's acceptable. Is it liquid? And unfortunately, real estate is not liquid. And then you have, on the other hand, your, your cash. You know, we can actually keep that under our mattress, you know, and if we did, the question is, is the risk manageable? Some would argue that, you know, their money is safer under their mattress, but I would argue that, you know, if your uh, house burned, then, you know, that's a risk that you probably could not afford. Um, not to mention, if your house didn't burn, then, you know, inflation would probably eat up on your money and you would be exposing yourself to a different kind of risk called purchasing power risk. So I would not say that the risk is manageable in cash. Um, in, is the return acceptable? Well, there's a 0% return there. So um, uh, that's probably not acceptable. And is it liquid? And um, the, the answer is probably yes. All right. Now, some people believe that because real estate looks like it's a better investment, moving that cash in real estate investment is a better way to put your money to work. But what if we can keep these two assets apart so you can have two assets working for you instead of one? And here we introduce um, where we can, uh, the, the, the strategy of OPM or using other people, uh, other people's money where uh, Robert can actually help you with. So leveraging other people's money to make money. Um, but before we get into this, uh, we need to understand the concept of simple versus compounded uh, returns. And this is one of the concepts that we teach um, in these workshops. So let's go over um, simple versus uh, a compounded return um, where let's say you have a million dollars earning 7%. In the first year, you're gonna get $70,000 um, in return. So your ending balance would be $1,070,000. Now in the next year, because it's simple return, you're gonna earn another 7% of that same million dollars and your ending balance would be $1,140,000 and so on and so forth until the end of that fifth year. As you can see in the bottom there, your balance ends up being $1,350,000. Now that's simple return. Now let's compound the return and see what the difference is. If you were to have that same $1 million at 7%, the first year, same thing, you're gonna get $70,000 in return. But in the second year, you're gonna take that $1,070,000 and you're gonna earn interest on interest. So you get a little bit more in the second year in the third year, in the fourth year. And as you can see, at the end, you have $1,403,409. So as you can see, the difference here is um, about $50,000 over that five-year period. So the question is, um, how do we apply this same concept in real estate investing? So let's take a look at some the same assumptions that we were talking about earlier. But this time, let's say, we can actually borrow money um, from, you know, from Robert at 7%. And it's probably low, lower than that, Robert, but this is just an example. Um, anyway, uh, you can borrow that at 7%. And let's say we can amortize that over 20 years. And um, your payments are going to be $7,753,000 per month over 20 years. That means at the end of 20 years, you would have paid the bank $1,860,717. Now, because you borrowed that money, you still have your million dollar cash sitting on the other side. So what do you say we put that to work for you and try to find an investment that can also return at a 7% return, but this time it's gonna be compounded. So the difference here is the amortized loan because you're paying the interest in the and and the um and the and some of the principal to bring it down is actually a simple interest right there and if you can do the same thing on on your cash where you can earn some compounded returns you're going to get the same thing where one million dollars over seven years at twenty percent compounded becomes one million four hundred or um, four million and thirty-eight thousand seven hundred thirty-nine dollars 
So the difference between the two is you picked up another $2,178,000. So going back to our assumptions earlier, um, where you have a uh, original investment of $1 million um, in that piece of real estate property with 7%, but this time you'd use the, OP, uh, the OPM strategy that we're talking about here, where the growth of your real estate would still be the same at 4,038,000, regardless if you have a loan on it, and your income would still be $600,000, but this time you picked up an extra uh, $2,178,000. This gives you a total investment growth over that 20 years of 6816000 thousand dollars and 761. So that gives you an annualized uh, return using that strategy going up to 10.07%. Now, please keep in mind that these are all just hypothetical examples for educational purpose only. The actual application of these strategies will rely on several factors before we can determine if it is a suitable strategy based on your financial goals and your situation. Now here at Abacus Wealth International, um, what we do to determine this is we require clients to go through our holistic financial planning process where we can examine your estate, your investment, your tax savings and retirement needs. And then this is done through a six step process where we initially establish your most important financial goals and concerns then we gather relevant data so we can uh, run an analysis and develop a, uh, recommendations and an action plan for you. And once you're comfortable with the recommendations, then we also help with the implementation process. And once everything is in place, we simply monitor your progress to make sure that you are on track to meeting your financial goals. Now, um, I know there's, there's gonna be a lot of questions and again, um, you know, we invite you to take advantage of the free 15 minute of uh, 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 no obligation uh, consultation with me. Um, you can do that again through my webpage at www.abacus-wealth.com or uh, through uh, the chat box. There should be a link there uh, that will take you to our schedule for a Zoom meeting um, and we can uh, take care of those questions for you. All right. Okay. And, and I think that's all the time I have for today. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to give the floor back to uh, Robert here and um, let's see. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen and there we go. Thank you, Joel. Super interesting stuff. I think, um, you know, to really grasp the full picture of it, I think people probably should schedule something with you. I mean, there's you know no uh, no loss in it except a little bit of time, but I think actually I, I seem to know that what you'll be able to uh, to teach them I think could be potentially life changing. Thank you, thank you, Robert. So um, with that, uh, I will uh, cover the uh, the mortgage section, and then um, after the uh, after we go over the mortgage options for foreign nationals and expats, um, we will open it up to a question and answer session. Um, so you can just uh, put some information into the chat. If you would like to register or sign up for a consultation with both Joel's team or uh, my team with uh, America Mortgages, there is a link in the group chat option. You can click on that and you can arrange something uh, you know, free of charge to be able to cover, you know, whether it's, it's Joel's side or it's the America Mortgages side. So. With that, um, I will share the slides and we'll go through the slides and then do the questions and answers after. So America Mortgages, if you're not familiar with our company, is a, a global mortgage broker. Uh, our parent company is Global Mortgage Group. Uh, besides offering mortgages in the U.S., we offer mortgages uh, pretty much in most uh, countries where they have a transparent mortgage market. Uh, the general overview for U.S. mortgages only 
All of our loan programs have no U.S. credit required, meaning that uh, you can use your home credit from whatever country that you're in. In the event you are in a country without a credit reporting agency, there are options for that as well. What makes it quite nice is these loans require no AUM, meaning this is dry lending. You will not have to open up a bank account and, and have a certain minimum during the term of the mortgage. This is a completely dry lending. It will fund without you having the requirement of opening up a bank account with that lender. Uh, foreign income is allowed. So regardless of where you live, uh, you can use your income, whether you're a foreign national or expat, meaning if you are a US expat, no W-2 is required for these loans. We have loan programs in all 50 states. If you're a foreign national, so not holding a US passport, um, you can qualify for up to 75% financing. If you're a US expat and you still maintain US credit, you can get up to 80% financing. If you're a US expat and you no longer have US credit, that's perfectly fine. You would actually qualify as a foreign national, but you would have the opportunity to re-qualify again as a US expat, probably after 24 to 36 months after reestablishing your credit. Normally, after you complete uh, your application and submit the required documents, we can issue you a loan approval within 72 hours, sometimes even quicker. The average closing time for a US mortgage depending on where you're going to sign a course is 30 to 45 days. And that's both for purchases or refinances or equity release. You can sign your closing documents in almost any country. And we have a variety of ways to do it from video to uh, online notary to a local notary to going to visit the US embassy or consulate. One thing that is very unique to the US 30-year amortized mortgages, regardless of the borrower's age, meaning if you're 19 or 99, you still can qualify for a 30-year mortgage. And one of the things that we're really happy about, especially as interest rates are higher, is we have a 10-year interest servicing only loan, which you'll wind up, you'll have a fixed rate for that 10-year period. After that 10-year period, the loan does not reset. So whatever the rate that you're approved at, that rate is through that 10 year period on an interest servicing only. It converts into a principal and interest 30 year fixed without an adjustment in rate. So you have a total 40 year tenure and it really helps where interest rates are higher now. Um, we have loan programs that have common sense underwriting, meaning it is treated as a true commercial investment and it qualifies only on the rental income of the property and not your personal income documents. Perfect for a self-employed client that may not show their true serviceability of debt. Uh, one thing that, or one of the many things that we're very proud of is we have a 97% approval rate on our application submitted. So if we submit your application, you follow our guide, most likely your loan will get approved. If it does not get approved, it's normally an issue with the property and not the borrower or the loan program. Uh, we have 24 seven service with 30 loan officers in 12 different countries speaking your language and in your time zone. No longer do you need to stay up to two, three in the morning to speak to somebody in New York about your loan that maybe doesn't even understand the conversion of finance or currency. So our loan programs are quite simple and straightforward. <clears throat> the most popular loan program, excuse me. The most popular loan program is our American Mortgages Express Plus. What this is, is as I explained before, this is very common sense underwriting. If you look at commercial properties and how commercial properties are approved, they're approved on the cash flow of the property, which makes absolute sense when you're talking about investing in rental property. So with this particular loan, no personal income documents are required. 
The only thing that we're going to do to qualify the loan is go off of the rental income of the property. If it's a non, if property is not rented yet, then we will, when we do the appraisal or the valuation report, we will get a supplement to that that'll also comp out the rental amount and that's the income to qualify. No US credit is required. We have loan amounts as low as $150,000 and up to 3 million on these loan programs, meaning that at 75% loan to value, pretty much anybody can be a real estate investor as the minimum purchase price would only be $200,000. Um, there, again, this is no AUM required and the minimum uh, or the closing time is actually 30 to 45 days. I'll show you an example of how this program works. So if you take the gross rental income as an example of $2,400, you take the mortgage payment, which would be considered the principal, the interest, the tax and insurance is required. If that is $2,400 or less, the loan qualifies. We can use 100%, sometimes, even with some programs, maybe even a little bit more of 100% of the rent. Um, but what this means is in the event the rental income comes in short, even though rents are very high now, but it's still kind of catching up when it comes to doing the valuations for rent. But even if the rent comes in short, it doesn't mean that the loan qualifies. It just maybe means that there's a little bit more down payment required. So our AM investor um, uh, plus loan is a very simple letter, a very simple loan program that replaces having to provide your tax returns. Because we're doing loans all over the world from borrowers from Shanghai to Sydney to Manila to London, if we had to go through tax returns, it would actually almost be impossible. So rather than providing your tax returns, and rather than going off of the income of the property, what we require is that if you're employed, a letter from your employer, if you're self-employed, a letter from your accountant, and that letter merely needs to state two years of your past income and your current year-to-date income. That is sufficient, no need to provide your tax returns or pay stubs. Again, as with all of our loans, no US credit is required, $150,000 minimum loan amount, no AUM, 75% financing for foreign nationals, 80% for expats. Again, how this works is very much probably like in your home country, we have a debt to income ratio, uh, meaning that uh, for this particular case, it happens to be a 47%. Uh, if we take your gross income, so your income before tax, and we deduct the uh, mortgage payment again, which is principal tax insurance, um, as long as it is at 47% or below, the loan qualifies. Uh, the AM high net worth mortgage, this is something that is extremely popular with um, mainly our, our private bank clients. This is a very simple, easy way to qualify a high net worth clients. We know high net worth clients have multiple you know, jurisdictions of their tax returns, very complicated uh, write-offs, tax returns, et cetera. We are not going to require their tax returns. What we would require is two months of their liquid portfolio. And this is something that if you're investing with Joel, Joel can certainly assist you with, or if you need to combine things from different banks, absolutely possible. Once we have all of these statements, we're going to take a monthly average. Uh, the great thing about this loan program is even though we're using these assets to qualify, there is no uh, encumbrance on these assets. The only encumbrance, just like a, a normal mortgage, is on the property that you're buying or refinancing. Uh, again, no AUM is required, no US uh, is required. These loans uh, are starting from 3 million and they can go all the way up uh, to a, a 100 million plus. Again, how this qualifies, very straightforward and simple. If you were to take your two month uh, portfolio average of say $5 million of stocks, bonds, and say cash in the bank, 
we would divide that over a 60 month term. That 60 month term equates to the fixed portion of this specific loan. That would give you eighty-three thousand uh, dollars approximately of monthly income, and meaning that your mortgage payment could be you know, eighty thousand dollars a month, which would allow you to qualify for a sizable uh, purchase of an asset. Uh, if you're a U.S. expat, uh, we've tried to make this loan, our AM U.S. Expat Plus, as easy as if you were living, working in the U.S and walking into your local bank. It's that simple, same rates, same programs. The only difference is there's no W-2 required and your foreign earned income is absolutely allowed. It makes being a foreign national borrower as easy as it gets. Supply two years of your tax returns, pay stubs, et cetera, have at least a 680 US credit score, and you should be able to qualify. Loan amounts, again, starting at $150,000 with up to 80% financing for an expat. Again, this is how it qualifies. We also have to take into account the debt to income ratio. For a US citizen, this would also include any debt that you may have on your US credit report, such as credit cards, car payments, et cetera. All of that, including your housing, needs to be below 47% of your gross income. Uh, happy to go over this uh, in more detail if anybody has any questions. Uh, this is a, a very unique program that we launched uh, a few months ago. Actually, time flies, even more than a few months ago, last summer uh, for the upcoming uh, college students. We realized that there is a lot of parents and a lot of our clients that want to buy properties for their children that are going to school in the US. This loan program works very similar to the uh, AM Investor Plus, meaning that again, we're not going to ask for your personal income documents. We're going to go off of what the rental income would be generated from that property, even though that property will be occupied by your child an absolutely fantastic program to qualify if you're looking for a place for your child to live. And these loans also can go forward past when, you're, when your child graduates and it can become an income producing property. Again, up to 75% financing qualifies only on the rental income of the property, meaning no personal income is required. Loan amounts from 150,000 to 3 million. And again, very similar to the AM Plus, it qualifies off of rental income, very straightforward, a one-for-one -one, uh, exchange on the rent to the uh, mortgage payment. So that's all. That's my presentation. Uh, if you have any questions, you can, you can scan the QR code on your screen now, um, and that will bring you to um, uh, our website, and you can um, inquire about a loan or talk to one, uh, talk to a loan officer direct. Um, I will open this up to a question and answer session. Um, both Joel and I will uh, be on it. And then um, anything that you have, please feel free to ask. Anything additional, again, remember there is a, uh, a sign up within the group chat that you can uh, put your information in and you can schedule a call with uh, the American Mortgages teams uh, or Joel's team as well. So with that said, Joel, thanks for, uh, thanks for joining us back here. Let me get to yes, the- Yes, very interesting there. stuff there. Yeah. Okay. Okay, first question. What are the pros and cons of having offshore accounts with bank deposits on tax haven countries. Joel, I believe that certainly would be you. Yes, yes. Um, you know, if you are a, a U.S. Uh, citizen, usually that is used by high net worth uh, U.S. individuals where uh, as, a, as part of their asset protection uh, plan. But, you know, unlike uh, a night before, that's the, the, the monies that you put like in the Caymans or, or the Bahamas or, or, or Nevis, um, those are still reportable in your income, and you, so you you still have to abide by uh, FATCA uh, regulations, uh, where you have to report anything over ten thousand dollars on an F bar, 
and um, anything over $200,000 in, in international investments or offshore investments um, on your taxes. Otherwise, you, you'll be um, having some penalties. Now, for non-resident uh, 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 aliens we, we, or, or non-US uh, citizens, uh, we, we use this as well as a part of an estate plan because when you invest you know, if you want to invest, say, in real estate through the U.S. and you use just your name as, and, and you're not a U.S. citizen, and you use your name, um, you might be subject to uh, estate tax of up to 40% if the value of your investment is over $60,000. So uh, the strategy of using a, an offshore uh, corporation or an offshore trust um, is actually a, a good way of doing it if you're not a U.S. Uh, citizen and then um, using that uh, to actually purchase the real estate or uh, investments through the United States. That way you avoid the 40% uh, estate tax if something should happen to you. Super interesting. Uh, you know, also too, just to kind of add to that, um, if, and, and correct me if I'm uh, not correct, but um, I believe the estate tax is only on the equity-free portion of, of the property. So by maintaining the highest loan to value on a mortgage yes. uh, throughout the term, yeah, you're, you're not going to be subjected to as much taxes. And there's also, I mean, many ways to mitigate it as, as you explained. That um, is absolutely correct. So it's uh, based on the net value of the assets that you are investing in the U.S., and a lot of times, you know, I mean, if you're if you're high net worth and you're investing into the U.S., you're going to hit that sixty thousand dollars. So it might be a good uh, idea to actually uh, do some strategies to uh, mitigate that. And, and you know, one thing too, Joel, is um, you know, I think the U.S. has a very bad tax rap. Meaning <laughs> that uh, people people think, oh my gosh, the U.S. it's 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 you know overly taxed or whatever. But when it comes to real estate investing. Uh, yeah. You know, as Joel can tell you, it's probably one of the smartest ways to do it, because as a foreign national or an expat, you have the same tax advantages as a U.S. citizen has. There's no other country that has that. There's no stamp duties. There's, you know, almost ways to write off, you know, almost any income that's earned. And, you know, Joel's a perfect guy to speak to this, uh, you know, on, on a consultation. So uh, with that said, I'll get to the next question. Can a non-U.S. citizen invest in the U.S. stock market? That's a good question. Oh yes, definitely, definitely. We, um, you know, but then again, I revert back to my my previous previous statement about you know if uh, if the investment is over uh, sixty thousand dollars, then we we probably have to go that route. You know, where we might have to look at you know foreign trusts or uh, foreign corporations and use those corporations or trusts to actually um, invest. Uh, into the U.S. stock market. Okay. Uh, next question. Can I hold my real estate property under my IRA? Ah, uh, good question. Good question. Yes. Yes. <laughs> um, yes you, you, you can actually do that, uh, you know, and uh, you'd have to go through a, a, a special custodian who will allow uh, real estate uh, in your IRA. Um, but you have to keep in mind, IRA, uh, a, a, a um, uh, real estate is not liquid. Um, so, you know, if you're close to the age of 73 and you're going to be required to take minimum distributions and the only thing that you have in your IRA is real estate, then you might be forced to uh, liquidate that or find some way of having some liquid money in the IRA uh, to satisfy the required minimum distributions at the age of 73. Hmm. That's, a, that's, that's actually really valid because I, I don't think people think that far along and, you know, unless they're actually at that age. So um, one thing too, uh, you know, you can uh, hold your property uh, under an LLC or under some U.S. entity, which may mitigate uh, many things. And it's, it's absolutely a very common thing for not only foreign investors to do, but U.S. investors to do as well. Yes. And, and we have some other strategies that we can actually grow that stuff uh, tax-free. So 
Um, yeah, but it's just a little too complex. <laughs> but uh, yeah, something we can we can discuss, you know, uh, more on a one-to-one on -one -one basis. Sure. Uh, next question, is there any age restrictions or limitations for retirees applying for U.S. mortgage? Uh, again, so there are really some excellent questions uh, today for this this webinar. There is not in the U.S. I know most countries that you're probably living in, if you know, in, unless you're a U.S. expat, uh, they have age restrictions on the mortgages, whether it's based on a working age or a certain specific age that the government, uh, you know, and that puts into place. For the U.S., you cannot discriminate against anything including age. So age, sex, religion, marital status, whatever it may be, it cannot impact your ability to get a mortgage. Uh, for somebody that's 19 or 99, they have the same opportunity. So to answer that question, there is no age restrictions. You can qualify for whatever the maximum amortization period that is available. Next question, I'm working with a US-based mortgage broker and seems he can easily get me 90% LTV or more. What is the benefit of your mortgages over this? Very, very good question. If you can get 90% um, I, and, and you have a great rate, I think you should do it. One thing that you uh, should probably keep in mind is this is all we do. 100% of our clients are foreign nationals and expats. We have probably the most vast amount of programs that are available and the, probably the highest industry knowledge. And I can tell you most mortgage brokers or lenders in the US probably see one expat or foreign national out of 100 borrowers. And maybe what they're telling you, they believe is accurate, but I think when you come down to doing the transaction, I don't think that you'll get 90% financing. If you do, please email me directly because I would like to know who the lender was. Uh, next question. Can you provide more information on the LTV ratios and down payments required for a non-US citizen? Uh, for a non-US citizen, we can get up to 75% financing with a minimum loan amount of 150,000. So if it's a purchase or a refinance, the value of that property has to be at least $200,000. Um, but again, you know, we can go up depending on the loan program up to uh, almost any amount. Um, and we have these loan programs in all 50 states. Uh, next question. If I want to consolidate in the USA with properties in Ohio and Atlanta, who should I contact? Uh, we will have somebody reach out to you. Uh, we have a very good uh, concierge program, and, and Joel's company is part of that. So when people have questions, in, in your case, uh, looking for Ohio and Atlanta real estate, we have realtors uh, or um, advisors that we've worked with in the past in all these countries. We trust them. We know that they're going to be able to provide the same service, service quality that we provide at American Mortgages, and we're happy to refer you. Next question. Uh, Joe mentioned 7% compounding. What gets you 7% compounding these days without taking a ton of risk? I don't think real estate anymore at today's prices. Yes, um, as, as, as I mentioned, uh, these are all just hypothetical um, cases. And, um, you know, please don't take it too hard. Uh, it, it's just for educational purposes to, to show you the difference uh, between those two. Um, but, you know, if, if, if you're looking for uh, investments that, um, you know, have good return, that are safe and so forth, then that's something that will really depend on your risk tolerance and, and so on and so forth. So, you know, we have to evaluate that first before we can make a recommendation. And, and I think going to the real estate side, uh, I mean, Larry, sure, uh, obviously interest rates are significantly higher than they were post-COVID, but... If you look at what's happening in the market and you look at these, these major funds such as BlackRock, uh, JP Morgan, they're buying residential real estate now because this is a buyer's market. No longer are they getting outbid for properties and rental yields are extremely, they, we haven't seen rental yields like this in decades. Oh, yes. if, if interest rates remain the same, then you have a fixed rate for 30 to 40 years, depending on what you have. Um, if interest rates go down, 
then you can refinance the property. It's it's that simple, but you're not always going to be able to have this advantageous market to buy the properties in. Okay. Good point. Very good point. Yeah, thanks, Joe. Uh, next question, how do I assess you? How do you assess US versus European real estate as investment vehicles since you offer mortgages for both? Um, everything is done off of valuation report. Um, all the valuation reports are third party. We don't control them. Um, if you take the US, for example, it's almost done on a lottery. You go through an appraisal management system, you put the uh, address in of the property, and it will assign. A, uh, a valuer or an appraiser to that property. Works very similar uh, throughout Europe or in Asia as well. Whatever they come up with is the value that we use for the property. So it's either going to be the, uh, you know, if it's a purchase, it's either going to be based off of the purchase price or the appraised value, whichever is lower. Uh, next question, may I ask if the US expat who already has a home loan mortgage in his or her uh, currently residing country, is it eligible to apply for a loan to invest in the U.S. property as well? So I think I think um, it, you're you're stating if you have a home loan in the country that you're currently living in, can you get a loan in the U.S.? Absolutely. Um, you know what what also makes this unique is th this is kind of across all countries. Um, because the U.S. doesn't, the U.S. will report a credit agency in the U.S., but a U.S. credit reporting agency will not report into your home country. So it will not affect whatever the debt servicing ratio you may have in your home country when you own properties outside of that country. So um, as an example, if you own properties in Singapore, for example, it will not affect your debt to income borrowing in Singapore that you have a mortgage in the U.S. What makes the U.S. also quite unique is there's no minimums on or restrictions on the number of properties that you can have with a maximum loan to value. If there's loan programs that are available and they're 75 percent, you can have for one property or you can have it for 100 properties. Um. Next question, is it a good idea to have my real estate property in Australia under my U.S. trust? Uh, I, Joe, I don't know if you have any advice on that, but we do have an Australian specialist that uh, if you reach out to our company, we can, uh, we can have them uh, try to answer it for you. But Joe, I don't know if, if you have any insight on this, but you're welcome to jump in. Yeah, well, a, a yeah. A, a U.S. trust, you know, a, a revocable trust is is uh, is an estate planning tool, and and, and mostly it's used to escape uh, probate. Um, you know, now the probate laws in the U.S. is different from the probate laws in Australia. So if you have a, uh, you know, we go by situs, you know, on the assets. So if the situs of the asset is in Australia, then it's not a good idea to actually have that in your U.S. trust. Um, and vice versa, uh, because you know, uh, if if you had a, an Australian trust, for example, and you had real estate in the U.S., is the same thing. In fact, it might uh, do you more harm than good because of you know foreign uh, foreign uh, uh, taxes. You know that uh, that, that the uh, that that the trust would probably uh, incur uh, in the U.S. So uh, if you're trying to do some estate planning. Um, you probably want to do one in the U.S. if you have assets in the U.S. and then one in Australia. That way, uh, you, you you make sure your your assets are protected. Great, great, great answer. And, and I think that answer also goes back to what we discussed earlier. I mean, Joel's an expert in dealing with clients like yourself, foreign nationals, expats, people living outside of the U.S. but you know requiring uh, tax planning or or wealth planning. Same with uh, American mortgages. I mean, these are all the only clients that we see. And I think it shows to uh, the example of, of, you know, what we can provide and what type of programs and just the sheer knowledge that, that we, you know, we both have as companies. Uh, next question. If a family trust or an LLC is preferred, is it still possible to obtain a mortgage as shown or these must be under personal name? Um, 
I'll, I'll answer this because I think it's different when it comes to a mortgage or actually owning it if you were to own it cash or outright. So when you're, when you're applying for a mortgage, there has to be a borrower. There has to be a, the, a UBO. So um, you can apply for a mortgage as an individual, but you can hold that asset in a trust or an LLC, uh, whatever is uh, advised to you by you know, Joel's team or, or your tax accountant or whatever it may be that is optimal in, in, in how you would hold the property. But for a, obtaining a U.S. mortgage, it needs to be registered to an individual. And Joel, I don't know if you have anything you want to add to that. Um, no, I think you pretty much covered it. Okay. Uh, next question. Are real estate uh, capital gain taxable if I maintain a second home or investment property scenario? Um, I, well, you know, we can't give uh, tax advice, obviously, because um, that would be something that would be done by, by an accountant, you know, but uh, in terms of capital gains, um, you know, your, your assets outside of the U.S., real estate outside the U.S. is still um, subject to capital gains. And uh, you also get the, the deduction um, of $250,000 uh, if you lived in the property um, two out of the uh, five years, I think, or something like that, where, um, you know, you can get a, uh, a deduction on the estate or, or, or on the capital gains. Yeah, we, we, you know, we have, uh, just like Joel with, with uh, you know, financial advice, we actually have a, uh, another partnership or, or tie up with a company that focuses only on providing tax advice for foreign nationals and expats as well. So if you want to reach out to us after this, but we can um, send you that information. Or actually, if you go to our website and on our concierge page, which is like somewhere in the middle of the website, you can click on this as well and you can speak to, it's also free to arrange a the initial 15 minute call. Uh, next question, properties must be in the USA or other countries uh, are okay. Um, you know, certainly for American mortgages, they have to be in the US, but uh, we do have loan programs uh, in most, uh, uh, most countries that have a transparent mortgage market. Uh, next question, do the loan repayments include escrow amounts for real estate, taxes, and insurance, or can the borrower keep making these payments separately? Very, very good question, because it comes up uh, actually quite often. And if you're not used to uh, having a U.S. mortgage, this is can be a, a bit shocking for some people. So most mortgage lenders, uh, especially if you're a foreign investor, uh, require you to pay your taxes and insurance uh, with the mortgage payment. So just as an example, if, if the taxes are $100 and the insurance is $100 and the mortgage is $1,000, your payment would be $1,200. Um, there are options if you do want to pay it separately. Um, it actually becomes a little bit more expensive because the lender is taking a risk. If you think about it, in the event that you fail to pay some of these, uh, the government could impose a lien on the property and any kind of government lien is always in first position, even if there's a mortgage. So it, it impacts the mortgage lender and that's why they do require it. Uh, next question, are there workshops like this for global mortgages? Uh, I am self-employed US expat in Spain shopping for a mortgage. Um, yeah, absolutely. We, we, have, um, we have webinars for global mortgage group as well. Um, again, if you email us, I will put you in touch with the, the, one of the people in our European office, um, and they will be able to assist you with the Spanish mortgage. I know for a fact that we can do loans in Spain. Um, do you have offices in Australia or New Zealand? Joe, do you, are, are you? Um, yeah, well, you know, I'm, I'm located in, in, in the Philippines right now. We are U.S. Uh, uh, registered. And um, I cover uh, pretty much uh, all of Asia. So uh, yes, I, I can meet with uh, people uh, in, in, in mostly in the Asian territories. Okay. For us, uh, we do have loan officers uh, that are uh, based in both Sydney and, and Melbourne. Nobody in New Zealand, unfortunately. And if you'd like to meet with somebody, we can possibly arrange that. Uh, next question, what is the benefit of paying cash for my property in the USA? Joel? Well, you know, as, as we just discussed, you know, uh, 
it, it's really a case by case basis, uh, Robert. You know, uh, so you know, in in doing the financial plan, you know, we're able to determine and make recommendations. You know, if that is actually a sound strategy or not. You know, and then we back it up with numbers. So uh, that's that's really a, a question we can't you know we can't answer right now until we know that what the situation really is. Sure. I, in, in, in my personal opinion, especially because, um, again, as a foreign national or an expat, or, you know, however you, wh wherever you fall, you still have the same tax advantages as a U.S. citizen. So if, it, Joel, Joel brought this out, if you can use other people's money to be able to acquire properties, I think there's far better uses for your cash, personal opinion. Correct. Right. Um, as an Aussie with an Aussie trust that owns a U.S. LLC that owns a Chicago property and oil wells, no debt already, can I get GMG U.S. loan in the name of my LLC or my Aussie trust? Um, that is, a, I think, a very in-depth question. Um, as long as there is an individual borrower... It looks to me like there may, and I, I know this is quite popular in Australia to do a blocker. Um, as long as there's a UBO, so there is the, the ultimate beneficiary of the, um, of the mortgage, meaning that somebody is applying for it in their name, we can uh, look at uh, doing a blocker. It does make the loan options limited, but it's not impossible. Um, what is the distinction of a transparent mortgage market? Um, Joel, did uh, I don't know if that's okay. Yeah, I'm I'm not exactly sure what that ex what that specifically means. Transparent mortgage market. If I mention transparency, it's probably in the fact that any costs for a loan um, are are uh, divulged or emailed or sent to you, however you choose to receive them within three days of applying for this mortgage. We are absolutely transparent when it comes to any fees and costs. The last thing we want you to do is to go to that signing and that closing table and, real, and see that the fees are significantly more than what you thought. So as a company, we send out our closing statements three days after applying for that loan. As long as the loan program doesn't change, your, your financial situation is the same that was disclosed initially, then when you close that loan, the numbers will be the same or less. Uh, next question. My young children are Aussie USA dual citizens. Would AWI recommend that they renounce their US citizenship from a tax perspective if they plan to live and work outside of the US? Wow, I think everybody's asking this question, John. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you know, it's 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 again, you know, that's a case by case basis. But you know, uh, it, it's it's too early to tell. You know, if uh, if the kids are going to be earning this much, or you know, some parents want their children to have the option of choosing between a citizenship between the U.S. and Australia. And, you know, there's a lot of factors that really have to be considered, um, you know, to renounce your, your your U.S. citizenship, you know, while you're young and you don't really have much assets, um, you know, the exit uh, expenses would be a lot less, definitely. Um, but of course, you know, your children would probably not have the option of, uh, you know, having that U.S. citizenship uh, later on in life, you know, so it's it, it's really a ma matter of perspective. You know, so, uh, uh, you know, in terms of, of, of taxes, well, you know, I, I, I still think, you know, like the Australia has a higher tax hierarchy, uh, as a matter of fact. So um, it's really just the hassle of having to report those taxes and taking credits, you know, from the taxes that you're paying in Australia in the U.S. So you still avoid uh, double taxation there. So, um, you know, so if, if, if tax is, is, is the problem there, Australia still has a higher tax hierarchy right now. We don't know what the future holds, you know, in terms of how these taxes are going to work and how the relationships uh, between the countries are going to work and tax treaties and so forth. So, 
uh, you know, the, 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 that's really very hard to tell, you know, with, with, you know, what the future holds. Yeah, I absolutely agree. I, you know, I think, especially as an expat myself for the last, I guess, coming up on 13 years, you always have the, should I give up my, uh, you know, should I give up my passport? Should my kids give up my, their, their U.S. passport? I, and I just think it's, it's really a, a personal thing for, for each person and, you know, what benefit they have or, or so. Yeah, it's a, it's a big pain, you know, in yes. the hoo-hoo and, but, you know, but hey, you know what, it, it, it's, it's, it's a matter of preference, really. I agree. Okay, uh, looks like last question. Uh, Robert mentioned rental yields attractive in this market. Uh, what are the cities areas that you recommend? I spent a lot of time looking in California recently and nothing looks like value at this moment. Um, you know, I think it really, well, for one, it depends on um, your, you know, your purchase price of, of the properties. Um, certain markets or the markets that we really see a lot of value and really good yields in uh, is still Florida and Texas. Um, I, you know, I, I think if you look at both of those markets, over the last couple of years, uh, and it has to, uh, a lot to do with taxes and you know a business friendly environment. A lot of companies are moving into uh, these areas. A lot of people that would normally buy owner occupied properties are really kind of sitting on the sidelines right now. People that have mortgages that are say sub three percent, they're not choosing to sell. So you're having this 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 massive shortage of properties that are available. Um, and you have the, this, this uh, cost of owner-occupied properties where people are choosing not to buy properties and to rent. So it's forcing rental yields uh, into, to some of the highest we've ever seen. Um, and if you, again, if you look at, at states like Texas and Florida, I think you're going to see some absolutely fantastic yields, whether you get a mortgage or you pay cash. So um, it looks like that's all the questions again. There is in the group chat, uh, there is an option if you want to schedule uh, a 15 minute consultation with uh, Joel's team or the American Mortgages team. Um, and, uh, you know, any questions that you may have that we didn't answer, uh, feel free to email uh, us. You, everybody on this, this webinar will receive a, uh, a video. Uh, summarizing this, we'll have everybody's contact information probably within a week. Um, and if you have any questions, uh, you can email myself, you can email Joel, or you can email anyone on any of our teams. And Joel, do you have anything, any parting words you'd like to say? I think that uh, pretty much wraps it up. Thank you very much, uh, Robert, for having me here. And, um, you know, as Robert was saying, please feel free to reach out. You know, we're, we're, we're accessible here. So. Perfect. Anyway. All right, well, Joel, thank you very much. And thank you for your team and helping uh, set this up. And of course, always thanks for the American Mortgages and Global Mortgage Group team as well. So we'll see you next time uh, for our webinar, which will probably be in about two weeks. Thanks, Joel. Take Great. care. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you, everybody.